Raffone, Mr. Mike Raffone, Mr. Microphone. Are you there, Mr. Microphone? <laughs> uh, if you guys can hear Mr. Microphone, please type yes in the comments. That way I know that you guys can hear me and we can move on and talk about the weather. All right, type yes in the comments and hopefully everything is working out well with the audio. Oh, I see a bunch of yes comments, that's good news. All right, what do you say we get started? Hey, good morning, everybody. Well, wait a minute, where, where am I? Where, where, where am I? Hey, good morning. I played a little trick on you guys. I figured I would hide from you. <laughs> you could hear me, but not see me. Well, now you can see me just fine. Okay, who's out there this morning on Facebook? All right. Good morning to Brennan Leverton. Uh, good morning to Gaurav and Myra. Uh, hello to Debbie and Grayson in Black Creek. Uh, we've got uh, Michelle and Josh in Pulaski. We got Cara uh, in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. Chesapeake, Virginia. I love Virginia. When I was a kid, my parents, uh, they live in New Jersey. Um, every summer they would drive me down from northern New Jersey down the Delmarva we would cross the Chesapeake Bay Bridge which if you haven't been on the Chesapeake Bay Bridge it's amazing like you're out in the middle of like the bay or at least where the Chesapeake Bay meets the Atlantic Ocean and you don't see land it is like the coolest thing and my parents used to co-own a home in Sandbridge Beach which is uh, south of the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, my grandparents lived there and my parents co-owned the home. And I used to go there like every summer. And I'd be there for like two weeks at a time, going to the beach every day, getting out the boogie board, lay flat on, on my stomach and ride in the waves. I used to do it for hours on end. And it was like, you know, paradise. I used to love that. So anyway, so good morning to Cara. Uh, in Chesapeake, Virginia, we got uh, Brooke in Grafton with John, and we've got uh, Valerie and Robert in Swamico, Judy in Manitowoc, Betty in Darboy. Uh, Ryan Hartman says, Good morning from Holy Spirit School in Darboy. Mike says, May the fourth be with you. All you Star Wars fans are excited. Today is your day. All right, and we've got Sarah Catherine joining us today. Good to have you out there, Sarah Catherine. Uh, and hello to Callie and Megan Christensen. Thanks for joining us here. All right, so lots of folks saying hello this morning. And uh, today we have a few weather topics to talk about. We're going to be talking about uh, dew, frost, ice, and fog. And when we, you know, these are all four different things that we're talking about, but they're all kind of lumped together because they all tend to have to do with what we call condensation. And condensation is a major part of the, the water cycle. It's something that happens every day in our atmosphere. The water cycle is critical for, for us to live, for other living beings on this planet to survive. We've talked about the water cycle in past installments of uh, Weather School. Uh, basically, think of it this way. Wherever you're watching me from, maybe you're watching me in your home, in the living room or the kitchen or the family room or wherever. Take a deep breath <gasps> and exhale. <sighs> you just breathed in air. But in the air, the atmosphere around you, there is water vapor. You don't see it, but it's present everywhere you go. So every, everywhere you go, there's air, and it, ha and it holds a certain amount of water vapor. You tend to notice the water vapor when it's humid outside. You tend to not notice it as much when the atmosphere is dry. But if you take the air and start to cool it down, eventually you cool down the air enough where that water vapor in the air begins to turn into fog or a cloud. It goes through condensation. We cool down the air where all of a sudden the atmosphere becomes saturated. It hits 
the lowest possible temperature, what we call a dew point, before the atmosphere becomes completely saturated, where we go through condensation, where we create a cloud or a fog or something like that. Your temperature can't go below that dew point. So once that temperature reaches that dew point, the atmosphere becomes completely saturated. Now, sometimes the dew point and the temperature can drop together, um, but it basically the dew point acts like a natural barrier for the temperature to go no lower than that dew point because once that happens, the air is saturated with fog, clouds, or whatever. So everything that we're talking about today hinges on condensation. So if there's one thing today that is so important for you to remember is condensation. <sighs> condensation on my glasses, the warm water vapor, hitting my cooler glasses, creating fog. That's condensation. So fog is something we'll talk about today in weather school. All right, so we're going to go right into this now. So the first thing that I want to show you, we have to talk about what is called radiational cooling. Now this is basic, the basic principle of how it cools down at night. And you'll see where we're going with radiational cooling. So Let's pretend that it's outside and the temperature outside is 44 degrees, okay? And then during the daytime, oh, I probably should back it up so you see me. So during the daytime, it warms up, right? Let's say it warms up to about 71 degrees outside, a pleasant day, kind of like how it was on Saturday or Sunday, right? Nice day outside. And then once the sun sets, well, the warmth of the day begins to float up into the atmosphere. So the heat from the warmth of the day rises and the air temperature near the ground, near the surface, begins to cool. So we cool down to 43 degrees for a low temperature overnight heading into the following morning. That's known as radiational cooling, the cooling process at night where the warmth of the day floats up into the atmosphere. And that cooling process happens faster, generally under clearer skies, where when you have clouds overhead, that tends to slow that radiational cooling. Usually you'll find the quickest drops of temperature overnight on clear skies and light winds, okay? That's radiational cooling. We warm up during the day, and then at night, that warmth floats up into the atmosphere and we cool down. And it's important to know what radiational cooling is when we talk about dew and frost. So this is how dew forms along the ground. So here's the setup. We've got the sun warming up the earth during the day. So the temperature climbs into the 60s or 70s or whatever. But then at night, when we go through that radiational cooling, the heat rises and the air just above the surface, above those blades of, gra of grass, all of a sudden that temperature drops down to 44 in this example. Well, the dew point is 43. So you see how that air temperature has come down to meet the dew point, the temperature where moisture begins to form. And so what will happen is that temperature will drop down to the dew point and that cooling forces moisture on the ground. You see the little beads of water, liquid water that forms in the above freezing temperatures on the blades of grass. That is dew because the air just above the surface, right above those blades of grass, has cooled down enough where the air right above the grass becomes completely saturated and so those little beads of water stick to all those little blades of grass and so all of a sudden the grass in the morning is sopping wet that's because we have formed dew when that air has cooled down and reaches its saturation point its dew point does that make sense hopefully it does all right do we have any questions about this here uh let's see here Let's see here, Joey Chang, Zara asks, what is the difference between dew and dew drops or fog and a low cloud? Well, let's see here, let's kind of, it's kind of a combination question. So fog is a cloud that's on the ground. So a lot of times we see clouds up in the sky. Fog is just a cloud that's forming on the ground. So when you walk outside and there's fog, it's like walking into the middle of a cloud if you could walk 
into the sky. So that's really kind of the same thing. Fog and clouds are the same thing. It just matters as far as whether it's on the ground or if it's up in the sky. Uh, and as far as dew and dew drops, uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by dew drops. Do you mean dew drops like the drops that you see on the grass? That's formed from the dew. So and they tend to stick to the blades of grass. So hopefully that's kind of what you guys are getting at there, Joey and Zara. All right, so let's move on. So that's how dew is formed. Now, frost is pretty much the same thing, except now we're dealing with temperatures that are below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that is when liquid water turns to ice, to ice crystals. So in our situation here, we've got the, the sun heating up the earth, the temperature gets up to, say, 63 degrees, right above those blades of grass, right? And then at night, we go through radiational cooling, where all of a sudden that warmth from the sun floats up into the atmosphere. So the heat rises and the air just above the surface of the earth, above those blades of grass, cools down to 33 degrees in this example. Now moisture is going to form when we hit that dew point, which in this example is 32. So you see how the temperature and dew point almost match? Well, guess what? When that air temperature does match the dew point, see now they're both 31, now they're both 30. We're below freezing. So instead of forming dew on the grass, since we're below freezing, that liquid water has to turn into little ice crystals known as frost. So that cooling forces the moisture onto the ground. This time we have freezing temperatures, so the moisture freezes and fog forms. So dew and frost happen in the exact same way. Dew is when the temperatures are above freezing. Frost is when the temperatures are below freezing. All right. This is a time of year where a lot of folks who are working in their gardens are watching out for frost. Hopefully people haven't planted yet, but a lot of times people will plant their, their plants and then they don't want a frost to kill off their you know, freshly planted uh, flowers and whatever. Uh, and usually we tend to see frost, at least commonly, until at least Memorial Day. So uh, usually May is still a bit of a frosty month in the morning, but once we get into June, we tend to see fewer and fewer bouts of frost. All right, let's see here. Uh, Alicia wants to know, does dew form in places without grass? Yes, dew can form on various surfaces. Uh, sometimes dew and frost forms on the, the roof of your house, for example. Sometimes on a frosty morning or a morning that has a lot of dew, you can see the moisture on top of the roof of your home. Uh, yeah, dew and, and frost can collect on different surfaces besides just grass and besides just vegetation. Um, dew and frost tends to collect a little bit easier on vegetation because uh, because frost because green like um, you know, like plants, grass, trees, shrubs, they're also giving off moisture. They're giving off transpiration. Uh, they are breathing out some moisture, and so it, it tends to be more moisture available on grassy surfaces and on trees and on bushes because uh, these plants are, are breathing out moisture. So it tends to happen a little bit easier on green surfaces, but it can happen on other surfaces as well. Uh, let's see here, Jennifer Butler wants to know, does dew form in a desert? Not really easily done because the, usually the air is very dry in the desert. There's not a lot of moisture available. Not that it couldn't at all happen, it's just a lot, lot less likely because of the lack of moisture and also the lack of vegetation as well. All right, so those are some good questions here. All right, let's move on. So here's a question that I get asked a lot. I get asked by a lot of adults this question, and maybe you kids have noticed this too. So sometimes I'll be on TV and I'll be talking about the temperatures and I'll show a map of the temperatures. And the temperature will say 35 degrees, but then you look outside and there's frost. How in the world is frost forming when the temperature is not even down to 32 degrees and the temperature says 35? Well, there's a good reason why that is. Usually when temperatures are reported by either the National Weather Service or somebody who has a weather station, they're taken from a weather station that's off the ground. And usually the weather station is about four to six feet off the ground, where most people are noticing the weather when they're walking around. So the, the temperatures, the air right above the surface, 
may say 35 or 36 or 37 degrees. But right along the ground where that grass is, in a very shallow layer, right along the Earth's surface, it's probably a few degrees colder. It might be 32 or even colder than that. So the air above the surface actually takes longer to cool down than the air that's right along the ground. Because remember, cold air is heavy and it's dense and it tends to hug the Earth's surface. So the surface actually cools down first and faster and that's where the frost is forming. So you could have frost that's forming right along the ground where it's 31 degrees and then if you go up about four or six feet off the ground, the temperature might actually be above freezing, like say about 36. That temperature of 36 gets reported by the National Weather Service. It comes to me. I show it on a map. Green Bay is at 36 degrees, but you look outside and there's frost. That's because right along the ground, it's even colder than the air temperature that's being reported to you. Isn't that something? And so I get asked that question all the time by gardeners, by people who are just curious about the weather. It's because the ground temperature is even colder than the air temperature itself. Okay. Uh, Patty Grawl uh, from Abbey and Quentin can dew form when it is freezing. At that point, dew turns into frost. So once we get 32, once we get to the freezing mark right at the surface, dew will switch over to frost. And when we get below 32 degrees, we don't get dew anymore. Then we get frost. And the inverse, the opposite happens. When we get above 32 degrees along the ground, then we're not getting frost anymore. Then it's going to be dew. Because remember, 32 degrees is the threshold where whether water is liquid or freezing as frost. That makes sense? Turning into ice. Okay. So, sometimes it matters whether we are dealing with pavement versus grass. So, in this example here, and I'll take myself out of the picture so you can see this better here. So, say the sun is warming up the ground and it's daytime. So, the pavement is dark, right? The asphalt is like a black color or a dark gray. And because it is a dark color, it's absorbing more heat as opposed to a light color, which would reflect the heat. So the dark pavement absorbs more heat. The pavement temperature gets up to 75 degrees. Meanwhile, on a grassy surface, it's not absorbing quite as much heat as that dark pavement. So the pavement, uh, the, the temperature right above the grass is closer to 67 degrees. So you see how it's warmer on the pavement as opposed to the grass. Now, what happens when the temperature cools down at night? Well, the heat does float up into the atmosphere. The temperatures do drop, but you can see how the temperature at night on the pavement is not as cold as that temperature right along the grass. So in this example, the pavement temperature is 42 degrees, while the temperature on the grass is 35. And then as it cools down a little bit more, you can see how, uh-oh, the pavement temperature is above freezing, 37, and we're not going to get any frost because we are above the freezing mark, but the grassy surfaces has hit its dew point and is colder and is at 31, and you're seeing frost on the grassy surfaces. So grassy surfaces reach the freezing mark earlier, and the frost is forming, while the road surface takes longer to get to the freezing point and it may be, maybe not even make it to the freezing point and therefore you're not seeing the frost there. So sometimes like on an October morning, you know, if we did have school at, you know, school uh, instead of being at home and your parents back out of the driveway and they're driving off to school, you see the frost on the grass, but not on the road. This is exactly why, because the pavement temperature is warmer than the temperature along the grass. <clears throat> All right, so Kate and Austin wants to know, can frost form on water? That's an interesting question. Uh, no, frost does not form on water. Uh, if, if, anything, if, if anything icy forms on water, it would just be ice. It wouldn't be frost. So that's a good question there. Uh, Sherry wants to know, can dew and frost form at the same time? Um, not usually unless you had a lot of dew and then the temperature suddenly dropped to create frost. But even then, the, the dew would probably switch over to frost. I would say that seems very unlikely to me. I would say probably not. 
I, I, I can't say I've ever thought of a time when I've seen dew and frost occur at the same time. But that's a very interesting question, so thank you. All right, so let's move on. Let's talk about black ice. Have you ever heard about your parents talk about black ice? Black ice creates very dangerous driving conditions. In fact, a lot of people get into car accidents because of black ice. What exactly is black ice? Black ice is a very thin layer of ice that accumulates on the road, on the pavement, the asphalt. And you know what? Because this layer of ice is so thin, it's actually transparent. In other words, you can actually see through it. It doesn't look like the ice you would see on a skating rink. The ice is actually transparent, so you can actually see the road underneath the ice. So the transparency helps the ice to blend in with the dark pavement. So you're really not even seeing the ice. It's almost invisible, and it's very, very hard to see. So that happens when we have moisture going through condensation directly on the road surface, and it becomes icy. All right, so that tends to happen early in the morning when we have moisture and the temperature briefly ducks down to 32 degrees. It can happen in a few ways, actually. The first way that black ice can form is if we have clear skies overnight and if we have some snow that melts during the day and then when the temperatures cool down at night, that melted snow, which is now water, turns to ice. It freezes up on that cold pavement. And so that moisture, that water from the melted snow, turns into their very thin layer of black ice. The second way black ice can form is if we have cold pavement and then light rain falling over top of it. So the rain falls and it hits that frozen asphalt, that road surface, and that turns into ice. Kind of similar to freezing rain, but a little bit different, right? So that rain hits the cold pavement and even though the air temperature might be a little bit above 32 degrees, the pavement is below 32 degrees, and so that water from the rain hits the cold pavement, and it turns into that black ice, that very thin layer of ice, and the roads become very slippery for drivers, especially early in the morning when they're heading off to work. The third way that black ice forms is because of fog, what we call freezing fog. Water droplets freeze instantly on the road surfaces that are freezing cold below 32 degrees. Uh, we have situations across the area, especially during the winter time, when fog forms below 32 degrees and the roads can get very slippery, especially in rural areas. See, on heavily traveled roads, when the tires from multiple cars drive on the same pavement, that helps to break up that ice. But especially in rural areas where you have freezing fog, you don't have as many drivers driving on the roads. And then you have somebody who does go down the road, and it's just like a, it's like a sheet of ice. It can be very, very slippery. All right, so let's see here. Uh, Jensen wants to know, would it melt if it's 32 degrees? If we get above 32 degrees, yes, that, that black ice would melt if we get above 32 degrees. But if that pavement temperature stays below 32 degrees, then the ice is not going to be able to melt. Uh, Tammy uh, Gardig wants to know, does the, does the sun affect fog? Well, the sun helps to warm the atmosphere up, which helps to get the fog to, uh, to lift or to, uh, some people say, burn off, even though that's really not quite an appropriate term. But as the sun warms the atmosphere, that helps the condensation to, uh, to end, that process to, uh, to stop, which helps the fog to disappear. All right, so three ways that black ice can form, and all of them are very dangerous for drivers. And you know what? Black ice forms a lot on bridges. If your mom and dad drive on the Leo Frigo Bridge in Green Bay, or if they drive on the, um, the Butamore Bridge down in the Fox Cities, these are places where we have seen dangerous driving conditions because of black ice right on the actual bridge itself. So what happens is, is that we have cold air above and below the bridge. So in this example, the pavement temperature is 38 degrees. So that's above freezing and it really shouldn't be icy, right? But then the driver coming towards the bridge drives over the bridge. The bridge gets colder because the air above 
and the air below the bridge is at 26 degrees. So the cold air above and below the bridge actually makes the bridge colder than the road leading into the bridge and past the bridge. So that air temperature drops below freezing, the bridge is exposed to cold air above and below, and the bridge ices up before the rest of the road does if there's some moisture going through condensation on that bridge surface. So especially in situations I would say early in winter and late in winter, bridges can be very dangerous, especially early in the morning where we're getting that black ice on the bridge surface itself. All right, so uh, Sarah Vissers wants to know, can dew form on cars? Absolutely, yes. Dew can form on cars. Frost can form on cars. In fact, if your parents park their car out in the driveway, and they get out early in the morning, they may need to take that little ice scraper and scrape off the frost from the windshield. Yep, frost and dew form on cars if they're parked outside. If they're in your garage, probably not. Uh, Patty Grawl and Quentin want to know, can you die from black ice? Well, unfortunately, there are instances where people are driving and they hit black ice, they lose control of their cars, people do get hurt, and if it's really serious, unfortunately, people do pass away. Um, so that's why we always encourage people to drive very carefully. And that's why during Action 2 News this morning, we take not just our weather reports very seriously, but our traffic reports very seriously, especially when Catherine Bracho is on and letting people know about black ice because it's definitely uh, a safety issue for people. We want to make sure people stay safe. No one wants to get injured or worse. So that's a very good question. Thank you, Quentin. All right, so moving on. Oh, come on, graphics. You can do it. Are my graphics going to behave themselves? There we go. All right, let's talk about fog. You'd be so surprised how many ways fog can form. Not just one way, multiple ways. Okay, remember we talked about radiational cooling? So when the sun warms up the, our atmosphere and then at night that warmth floats up into the atmosphere and our temperatures cool down. So radiation fog is because of radiational cooling. So here's the setup. So the daytime heat starts to leave the ground. And that process happens a lot faster on a clear night with light winds. So what happens is, is that as that air rises up into the sky, we get a thin layer of moisture that forms near the ground underneath drier air. So the rising air from the surface passes quickly through this moist layer of air up into the dry atmosphere above it, all right? So what happens is the moist layer does not absorb a lot of heat and the air near the Earth's surface cools down a lot quicker. So we have cool, damp air near the ground and then warmer, drier air above that, kind of like a sandwich, right? All above the ground. So because that's happening, we go through condensation. The air cools down, it becomes saturated, we hit our dew point, and as the moisture starts to rise, that water turns into a vapor and fog forms. This is something we often see late in the night, early in the morning. It's more common during the spring and the fall months because of rapid rises and decreases in temperature. Um, you tend to see it less often during the summertime and the wintertime when the temperatures are a little bit more stable. But especially early in the morning in the spring or the early mornings in the, in the fall, you tend to see radiation fog if the atmosphere is saturated enough. Okay. Let's see. Do we have any other questions here? Let's see here. Austin, uh, Austin and Katie want to know why the fog is darker than the clouds in the sky. Well, <clears throat> when you see the clouds in the sky, they're reflecting the sun's light. You're able to see the sun's light reflecting off the clouds over to you and where you can see it, your eyes. But when the fog is over top of you, we're not reflecting the sun's light. In fact, not much sunlight is able to penetrate through that cloud that's along the ground. And because you're not seeing that sunlight near the ground, it appears dark gray or sometimes like a, like a, almost like a black color if it's close to sunrise. And so that's why fog tends to be darker than the clouds up in the sky. Remember, the clouds in the sky are reflecting the sun's light. The sun's light hits the cloud, and that sunlight bounces off the cloud to your eyes where you can see it. And that's why that's, that cloud looks maybe like a brighter white color as opposed to a dark gray 
where that fog is hugging the ground is unable to, uh, to reflect that sunlight back at you. Okay. Uh, Christy Rom and Romney want to know, can hot air go into cold air? Yes, hot air can go into cold air, which can help create condensation. In fact, I'm going to show you advection fog in just a moment, which is when that actually happens. So that's going to be for you guys in just a moment. All right, so that's radiation fog. Have you ever heard of steam fog? Steam fog is kind of a cool thing. It's something we often see in the autumn, especially flowing over some of the wonderful lakes that we have in northern Wisconsin. So in our setup, we've got water temperatures that are in the 50s and air that's above that water that's cooler. It's in the 40s. So a cold air mass moves over a warmer lake or a small body of water. And what happens is, is that water begins to evaporate, and that adds moisture to the air near the surface. So we've got warmer water, and then right above it, moisture evaporating into the cooler air above it. Okay? Does that make sense? So that air just above the surface is warmed by the water below, but right above that, we've got that cold air. So what happens is that moisture rises into the cool air above it, that water turns into vapor, and it looks like steam coming off of the lake. You see how it has that kind of eerie look to it? It's kind of cool, huh? So that's known as steam fog. It's kind of a, a slang term, if you will, for a type of fog. And it looks like the lakes are steaming. Maybe you hear people talk about that, especially in the, in the fall and as we get closer and closer to winter time. There's something called upslope fog, and this has to do with topography. Usually this happens near large hills or mountains. So the setup is this. We've got cold air in the valley, in the low areas, and this cold air mass is forced to move towards the higher elevations. So this cold air mass is blown by the wind up the slope of the mountain. And that lift, that rising motion up the mountain allows that cold air to get even colder. So the cool air becomes even colder, which is helping our air mass to cool down and become more saturated where we hit our dew point, right? Remember the dew point, how we cool down and reach saturation? So that cooler air rising up along the side of a mountain turns even colder and we go through saturation where the atmosphere becomes very moist. That moist layer of air forms along the slope of the mountain and you tend to see fog. As the moisture rises, the water turns into a vapor and fog forms. I remember years ago, I used to live in New Jersey and I used to go to college out at Valparaiso University in Indiana. And so in order to go back and forth to college, I would have to drive through Pennsylvania, through the Appalachian Mountains there. And I remember there was a few times where I'd be driving through the Appalachian Mountains and I could see the fog forming towards the tops of these mountains. And it's because of upslope fog, the air being pushed up the mountain, cooling as it rises, hitting saturation. So all of a sudden we have that fog that forms on the side of the mountain. It's kind of cool to see. All right, so do we have any clouds here? Or, I'm sorry, any clouds? Ha! <laughs> any questions here? Let's see here. Ah, uh, let's see here. Brooke and John want to know why some clouds form on the ground and not in the sky. It all depends where, either on the ground or up in the atmosphere, where the air becomes saturated, where the air cools down enough to hit its dew point and then reach saturation. If that can happen up in the clouds, or up in the sky rather, if that can happen up in the sky, we'll have clouds. If that can happen on the ground, and we'll have fog. And sometimes it happens in both places. Whenever that air, whether it's, whether it's way up there or way down here, whenever it cools down and hits its saturation point, that's where the clouds are going to form. And if it's on the ground, it's fog. All right. Tammy uh, Gertig, is there more fog by lakes than trees? Uh, I I, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, you can get both. Uh, I do think you tend to see a little more fog near bodies of water just because there's more moisture available. Uh, we do get plenty of fog that forms around the Great Lakes, especially during certain times of the year. Um, but, you know, if you have an area that has a lot of trees, a lot of vegetation, you can get fog there as well. 
All right, so let's see here. Does, Alicia wants to know, does space get dew or frost from Celia? No, space, we really don't have that water vapor. See, that's the wonderful thing about Earth. We have water on our planet. Isn't it amazing we have water on our planet? You know, there are, there, I, I, I can't think of a whole lot of other places, you know, other, other than other planets where you have frozen ice where water is available. Uh, you know, so the fact that we've got liquid water and water vapor on our planet allows for the condensation process to happen. Once you get up into space, well, we don't have that water vapor anymore. So without the water vapor floating around space, it really can't get dew or frost. But that's, that's an interesting thought. All right. Uh, Brendan Leverton wants to know, is fog dangerous? It can sure be, especially if you're driving down the road and you can see where you're going and all of a sudden you drive into a fog bank and all of a sudden you can't see where you're going. And a lot of times people don't slow down in fog banks. And so all of a sudden they're driving too fast. Something pops up in front of them. It appears in the fog. There's not enough time to slow down. People jam on the brakes and they hit whatever they, they're hitting there. And a lot of times people are forgetting to put on their low beam headlights in the fog. <clears throat> Sometimes people put on their high beams, which you think, oh, that's going to help me see. But if anything, the high beams tends to, the, the, the light from the high beams tend to get scattered all across the fog in the water vapor. You really don't see any better with the high beams. And if anything, not only do they not help you, but they also serve to blind other drivers who may be driving in the opposite direction. So people should slow down when they're driving through fog. Use the low beam headlights. Be prepared to stop suddenly if something pops up in the road in front of you. If you slow down, it's a lot easier to do that than if you're driving too fast through fog. All right, so let's continue on. So we get fog sometimes from precipitation. Yeah, rain or snow can cause fog as well. So it's usually from rain. So what happens is, is that in precipitation fog, we have a warm air mass that moves in above the surface. So we've got the ground, we've got some air above it, and then above there is a warm layer of air. And that warm air is moving above the surface during a rainy situation, if we have some rain coming down. And then what happens is we go through evaporation. That those raindrops become warmer as they pass through that warm layer of air above the cooler air, which is closer to the ground. That the warm raindrops evaporate in the cooler air near the surface. So the warm air is it, it, helping that, that, that rain to evaporate as it comes down towards the cooler air. So what happens is, is that we get evaporation and moisture that's saturating the air very close to the surface, even though the rain has moved on out. So the precipitation has helped to moisten up the air right near the ground where it is cooler compared to the warm air above it. So as you guys have seen multiple times, whenever we have moisture and cooler air, that's the perfect recipe for condensation, right? Condensation and the air to hit its dew point, its, its point where it's hitting saturation, and therefore we get fog. So fog forming, the saturation of the air leads to the fog forming and it's because of the precipitation that fell and then moved on helping to saturate the air and leaving behind a bank of fog. Now let's talk about evection fog and this is where we had that question about how hot air moving into cold air possibly creating fog. It happens a lot along shorelines coastal areas. Here's an example. So we've got cool air being blown onshore. So we have an onshore wind with cooler waters near the coast. And then what will happen is, is that we have warmer and moist air moving over top of that cool water. So we've got cold water over Lake Michigan, right? And then we have warm, moist air that flows over top of the cold Lake Michigan water, and it's being blown on shore. Well, then what's going to happen is, is that that warm air mass gets cooled down by the water below. So the warm, moist air mass cools down because of the chilly water underneath it. And so that air cools, becoming more saturated with the moisture. And so what happens is, is that we get fog. And that fog will blow off of the water and on shore. So some, I've seen this happen like in Two Rivers and Manitowoc and Sturgeon Bay 
where you get this fog that forms out over the lake and then the wind blows it on shore. That's what's happening here is we get that warm, we get the moisture and we have the warm air and the moisture blowing over top of the cold water and it gets blown on shore. So sometimes that happens in that way. So that's a vection fog. Now, a vection fog doesn't always just happen by the water. A vection fog also happens on the land too. So in this situation, it's a little different but similar. We've got cool weather near the ground. The ground might be cold or there's cool air right above the ground and there's a strong breeze blowing over top of that cooler ground. Now in that breeze, we have a warmer, more moist air mass that's moving over top of that cold surface. So we've got a cold surface, moist, warm air flowing over top of it and that helps to create that fog because the warm air mass gets cooled by the ground below. And so as the air cools, it becomes saturated with moisture and therefore you're going to get fog. A classic example of this is during the winter time when we have snow on the ground and then we get a warmer south wind with temperatures above freezing. And so you get that mild air flowing over top of our snowpack and it helps to kind of loosen up and it helps to evaporate some of the moisture from the snow. And then as that air mass cools down, especially at night, then all of a sudden you can get some pretty thick fog. So the vection fog over land, that happens quite a bit in the latter half of winter or early spring when we're melting snow. So that's something we often see in Wisconsin. All right, so uh, let's see here. I'm going to go through this graphic and then I'll take some questions. Okay. So, not every place in the United States gets a lot of fog. So you're looking at a map of dense fog days, days where we have really thick fog. And you can see some areas don't get a lot of fog. Look out towards Montana and over towards Utah, down towards Arizona. They get fewer than 10 days of dense fog each year. Why is that? Does anybody know? The answer is because of the climate. They have a very dry climate in the Rockies, especially towards the Four Corner states. Remember we had the question earlier about does fog and dew and frost, does that form in a desert? Not, not usually because there's not much moisture. So with a lack of moisture, you don't get many days of dense fog. So that's usually something that you know, doesn't happen very often in the Rocky Mountains and in the, in the, down in the desert southwest. But there are other areas that get lots of dense fog. Look at the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington State. They get a lot of dense fog out there because they're getting moisture flowing off of the Pacific Ocean. Obviously, the Pacific Ocean is very wet. And as that moisture blows on shore and it cools down, you get areas of thick fog around Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington. But also take note, Towards the eastern United States, there are other areas that get a lot of dense fog. Look out towards portions of the Ohio Valley and the Appalachians. Look out towards eastern Kentucky and over towards uh, uh, West Virginia, over towards uh, portions of North Carolina. They get a lot of dense fog days there. There's moisture available. And remember the upslope fog because of the Appalachians, that air blowing up the sides of the mountain, cooling and going through condensation. They get a lot of dense fog in those areas. And dense fog is also commonly happening in portions of New England, especially up in New Hampshire, up into Maine, where there's some mountainous areas up there as well. Upslope fog is forming there as well. They have a cooler climate and there's sometimes moisture coming off the Atlantic Ocean. So that helps to create areas of fog there as well. And also you notice some fog along the Gulf Coast states as well. Of course, you're getting that moisture off of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you can see that in around Northeast Wisconsin, it looks like 20 to 30 days of dense fog happen in our area. Uh, we have cooler weather and we have some moisture from the Great Lakes. That's why we get a little bit more fog in Northeast Wisconsin compared to folks in Southern Wisconsin where it's not quite as cool compared to Northern Wisconsin and you may not have the moisture from Lake Superior aiding that fog as well. All right, so we've gone through all of our graphics about dew and frost and ice and fog. Do we have any other questions? Let's see, ah, Dave Newman, how much fog can form at the same time? 
Well, it's really hard to measure fog as far as like how much. We usually measure fog in visibility, like how far can we see. On a normal day, we can see about 10 miles in our sky. But once we see less than one mile, then usually it's foggy. And if we are able to see only a quarter of a mile or less, that's usually when the National Weather Service will issue a dense fog advisory. Sometimes the fog can be like really pea soup like where you can only see just a few hundred feet in front of you. That's when it's really dangerous to drive in. That's usually how we measure fog. We measure fog in visibility. How far can we see? Or in a lot of cases in fog, how far can we not see? All right. Uh, let's see here. Do we have any other questions about what we're talking about today? Gene Peterson, so when moist air hits cool air, it makes fog. Um, well, yeah, it, it's usually when the moisture in the cool air, when the moisture inside the cool air mass cools down enough, that's when we're creating the fog. We're creating that saturation. Um, but yes, if cool air hits moist air, then yes, we can also get fog that way as well. Remember, there's multiple ways of getting fog. And so if you want a refresher, you definitely go back and look at the different ways that fog can happen. But yes, if cool air hits the moist air, we can get fog that way as well. All right. All right. Let's see here. Uh, well, this is the last question here. Olivia wants to know why does fog stick down by the ground? That's a good question. Because near the ground, we have reached saturation. So near the ground, we've hit that point of saturation. Above the ground, the air is not as saturated. So if the air is not saturated, it's not going to create the fog. If the air is saturated near the ground, we'll have fog. So the fog can only form where the air is saturated, which is near the ground. And usually there's not as much mixing of the drier air above it down towards the ground. So the ground usually, uh, the, the, the fog usually forms in a relatively shallow layer near the ground. And then when the sun comes up and helps to warm up the atmosphere, the atmosphere mixes some of the drier air above, mixes down with the moist air, and the atmosphere mixes up from the heating of the sun, and the fog tends to fade away as we lose that condensation. Hopefully that answers that question. All right, guess what? You know what time it is? It is time for homework. It is time for parents' homework. All right, so here's what I want you to do. This is something that you guys can do with your kids. This is something that really helps to um, help them understand what the water cycle is, help them understand what condensation is, so what you want to do is you want to pick a day where it's sunny. Today we've got some clouds around the area, not the best day, but a sunny day. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to get a Ziploc bag, like a sandwich baggie, okay? And get your kids to draw on this sandwich baggie. They can draw something like this. All right, hopefully you can see what I'm holding up there. See the sandwich baggie? There's a little bit of a reflection of light. So a sandwich baggie, you can draw clouds and a sun. Have them draw the sky on like a Sharpie on the sandwich baggie, okay? And then take the sandwich baggie into the kitchen and put a little bit of water at the bottom of it, like no more than an inch or maybe even less, just, a, just enough to get the bottom of the sandwich baggie wet. And then get out some food dye. If you've got multiple colors of food dye, have your kids Pick whatever color they want for their food dye, red or blue or green or whatever. And then put a couple drops of food dye in the baggie. So you're going to have a sandwich baggie with a layer of water at the bottom. You see, in this kid's situation, it's blue. So your parent, yeah, the kids, they, they, they drew some puffy clouds there. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to tape, you want to tape that sandwich baggie to a window. You want to have it tape right up against the window. Pick a south facing window on a sunny day. So let the sunlight hit that baggie with the water that's colored in food dye. And do it like early in the morning and let it sit there and get the sun's rays on it all day long. And let's wait until the afternoon and see how the moisture in the baggie changes. 
what exactly do you see inside that sandwich baggie with the colored water? Does it look the same? Do you see condensation? Do you see something that looks like precipitation? Do you see any of the things that we discussed today? Do you see dew or fog or ice or, or any of that stuff? Frost, do you see any of that stuff? Have them talk about with you what's happening. What part of the water cycle is happening? What they're seeing? Why is that happening? Because a lot can happen inside a sandwich baggie that has a little bit of water and food coloring. Something for you guys to do on a sunny day. Speaking of windows, you know, I, I take a walk in my neighborhood with my wife. My wife and I, we love to walk in, in our neighborhood. And I love when I go by homes and you can tell that kids live there because they've cut out paper color hearts with construction paper with hearts and rainbows and uh, messages of stay strong and looking forward to better brighter days I just love that you know and if that's something that you know you, you're not doing with your kids and they want to do that go ahead go ahead and have them cut out stuff and put on the window along with their their, their baggie with water uh, and, and it, you know, it gives them uh, something to look forward to and, and, and it, it, not just something to look forward to and activity to keep them busy, but it, it's a great message for your neighbors who are walking around and who may be looking around and, and catching that message and, you know, helping to, you know, brighten up their day as well. Uh, so let your, let your sun shine so other people can see how, how bright the future is, even though we have some dark times right now. All right. All right, kids, make sure your parents do their homework. All right, thank you for going to weather school. I hope you enjoyed all the cool graphics about fog and dew and frost and all that fun stuff. And hopefully I'll catch you guys next week. In the meanwhile, I hope you guys enjoyed the weather we had this weekend. We got some cooler temperatures this week, but still get outside. 50s aren't too bad. We can still go outside and enjoy ourselves in the 50s. Just make sure you're doing some social distancing. All right, have a good day, guys. Good to see you all. Bye now.